Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming over. Uh, it's happened to be a smaller room than you know the number of people who wanted to, to attend. Uh, so thanks, thanks a lot for coming over, uh, even taking the space on, on the, the floor. <laughs> Uh, it's, so uh, my, my name is uh, Vlad Yatsenko. Uh, like people call me, sh in short, usually Vlad, because it's harder to pronounce my full name uh, for majority of people. I'm a founder and CTO uh, of Revolut. Uh, just with a quick audience check: How many people uh, heard of Revolut? Like, if you could raise your hand. O okay, this is good. So I don't have to do long introduction of what, what Revolut is. Uh, but today, um, I'm going to talk about uh, building a bank in general, what kind of challenges is there. I'm going to go uh, on the code level as well. Uh, not, not too much. I know it's a developer conference, uh, so it's uh, kind of going to be balanced between domain and tech, some technical problems that are typical for this domain as well. Uh, so let's uh, go. So, what, what is a bank uh, in, in general? In the past, we used to like people used to imagine a bank like this building with uh, uh, ancient columns, and because banks needed to portray that they are very safe, they can be trusted. People bring money there physically, uh, and essentially there was like, the main purpose. And then they started doing lending, borrowing, etc. But this thing is changing, uh, right? Because it was very inefficient. You had to cross distances. Uh, you had to do a lot of physical content. Uh, these days, bank, banks are realizing that uh, this is not working because of the wave of fintech, and we see a lot more of this happening uh, with the old banks. Uh, and it's because of the uh, rise of fintech that happened due to different factors, uh, due to the financial crisis in 2008, uh, that regulators allows new, uh, change the rules uh, in such a way so that it allows uh, new entrants to, to come into this market. And we uh, use that opportunity as well. So, but you know, it's important to uh, think, what was the purpose of the bank in general, right? It's like, obviously, like if, as of any, almost any business is to make money. Uh, as I mentioned, in the past, uh, People used to uh, use banks as just trusted vault, where they would put money instead of keeping uh, that money under, under their mattress. Uh, and then the main business of the banks, uh, and it is still, is borrowing uh, at one exchange interest rate from uh, some people and uh, lending that money at high interest rates to other people, and the business basically making this difference uh, on, on the interest rate. These days, uh, with the thing, et cetera, and in its financial institutions in general, they do a lot more, not, not just uh, borrowing and lending. Uh, what, how we think about banking today, it's cut payments, currency exchanges, investments, insurance, all the uh, controls to manage your money better, like uh, analytics, budgeting, saving accounts, the security of your account, uh, expense management, all these things, a list can go on, the, uh, the automation, the API, the open banking movement uh, in Europe, etc. So there's a lot of things that are happening uh, in banking in general. And this is how we see it today. And you can even do, uh, send uh, gifts with your, uh, with your money these days. So, but uh, how we see it, uh, what, the, what the, the main purpose of the bank is to help you get most value uh, out of your money. Uh, this is how we see our purpose in general, uh, uh, despite we often used uh, for mainly currency uh, exchange travel. Uh, this is our, you know, how we started. We, s we started with that problem first, and then we kind of naturally started growing, uh, I mean, Revolut as a business uh, into other areas, uh, thinking about it's like how to uh, help you to make more, uh, get more value uh, out of your money. Uh, and yeah, banks today look usually like this. It's an app and a card, and this is what, what you see most of the time. This is the, the new association of, the, of what a bank is, not that uh, big building as in the past. Uh, just uh, a little bit about Revolut, how we uh, offer value 
uh, our, our main core thing is the multi-currency. Uh, our mission is to offer global uh, multi-currency accounts with all the uh, f functionality around the accounts that links to your f uh, financial life. Uh, we do it at the moment by allowing you to hold uh, up to 29 different currencies, move them uh, frequent, without friction uh, and uh, fees. Uh, and also, uh, we allow to get exposure to five cryptocurrencies. Uh, and we got to this point from uh, when we launched in 2015. There was we supported only three currencies: three main currencies, pounds, euros, and dollars. Then it kind of uh, escalated, and now we're going uh, outside of Europe, launching uh, soon in other markets in Asia, in and America. So kind of we are heading towards this mission to making money frictionless, truly frictionless, truly borderless. Uh, just to give you some perspective as well on uh, our current scale, so at the moment we are uh, around uh, 5 million users. I put 5 million users because it's going to hit probably in the mark 5 million probably in the next two days. Uh, this is the uh, volume of transactions we're processing on a daily basis. Uh, so it's it's quite sizable if you look at the industry in general. Uh, just to give you again a perspective, the faster payments in the UK, the, the biggest banks process that many transactions a month. Uh, so here we're talking about a lot of other transactions, of course. A lot of them are card transactions, but just in general to give you uh, perspective. Uh, and how it looks now, it's uh, around 90 uh, Backend applications supporting all of this uh, uh, for mobile applications because we do uh, iOS, Android, uh, and we have products for retail and business, uh, and a bunch of web applications mainly mainly for internal use. Uh, and uh, this, all of this is built and supported by around 220 people, uh, and this, this number is changing uh, every week. Uh, so how all of this simple, what you used to see, right? very simple interface, right? this is like how you imagine the bank. At the back of it, this is just a very high level uh, approximation of what's happening at the back end. Uh, depending on size of institution, like, uh, a financial institution would be doing just some of it delegating outsourcing uh, to, to partners, uh, a lot of it. And with, with, in our case, we do pretty much all of it. We started initially with uh, partnerships to outsource things like compliance, uh, um, things like um, uh, f uh, payment, payment processing, etc. And we started bringing all of it in-house, kind of getting closer to, uh, to, kind of to the last mile uh, to now we have uh, connectivity to uh, many payment networks, uh, card, card payment networks like Visa and uh, MasterCard that's direct. Uh, it's now in beta, uh, so we're going to be switching uh, a lot of traffic to, to our own uh, connectivity soon. Uh, then faster payments, Swift, SEPA, there's a lot of uh, proprietary integrations with banks to make this whole system uh, work uh, efficiently and for you to just click a button and uh, make it as soon as possible at, at no cost. So, but it was not that, that big and complex from the beginning. From the beginning, it was uh, the MVP, right? I call it monolithic viable project uh, product. Uh, so it, it was uh, in a way monolith, uh, which looked like this. Uh, we are. Uh, I, Java House, so we uh, use, replica uh, we use um, uh, relational databases for storage, uh, so it may not sound too fancy, like there's no, no SQL, etc. but this is kind of the, the very foundational uh, style that we do. And we started just with these four applications. One was the API that was powering, powering the, the mobile apps uh, used by users, uh, card processing that would uh, process the, the cut transactions when you pay uh, online or at the point of sale. And our back office application and all of that was built 
kind of out of one code base that was monorepo, very simple, the, you know, making changes through factoring, very simple when you have just one code base, uh, and just out of that it was just four applications built. Uh, deployments were like non downtime time, very fast, 30 seconds to deploy any application. So it was very, the life was very easy. Uh, we, uh, good thing we, we from the beginning we went with PostgreSQL uh, as a storage, uh, and we learned learning uh, early on uh, how to scale uh, Postgres as well, uh, how to have replication backups with it. Actually, uh, PostgreSQL is probably one of the best uh, databases that exists uh, today. To which these things don't are not. I would say not as difficult they may sound to a lot of application developers. So yeah, so we I, I mentioned we were uh, doing all of it with one code base. Uh, uh, applications were stateless, which allowed to do non-time de non downtime deployments. Uh, everything was easy to manage, very easy to manage uh, logs just from uh, logging into SSH and doing your grabs and logs. Um, the monitoring was uh, very easy as well. We, we tried to set up our own uh, infrastructure with uh, ELK stack, but eventually decided where, when we started, we were only four people uh, as the whole company. Uh, so with only two technical people, so it was very, very hard uh, initially to manage all of that. So we decided to uh, forgo it and uh, use New Relic for monitoring, which works pretty well. Um, literally to enable monitoring zero effort for Java applications with New Relic. Um, in, yeah, as I said, we started this team with only two engineers, including myself, and then after almost a year of uh, being in production, uh, we, we grew to four people, and uh, there was quite a change for us at the time. Uh, and, but we, at the same time, when we were building the product, uh, there was uh, no one had experience building a bank before on understanding like different concepts. Uh, what, what's important uh, in general, right? It's like we're engineers usually are generalists. We can just know how to code, and we can take any problem, right? Give us enough time, and we will solve it. Uh, but there are certain caveats. So, from financial uh, industry, what's important is correctness. First of all, like we always tend to think about complexity, performance, etc. But the most important thing in, in finance is correctness, right? Everything should be consistent. That's why uh, transactional behavior is, is like number one priority. And the typical way to do transaction management, uh, as you know, is to have this annotation-based approach in Java, right? You put your annotations, then do some IUP with Spring or some other framework, and kind of very, very easy, right, to define your transaction boundaries. But uh, as in this example, you see, uh, this method, like transfer money, you know, for instance, starts growing. It because transfer money, it's not just as easy as just changing to balances. There's a lot of things you need to do, to, uh, do some validations, fraud checks, etc., uh, and that can become quite complex. And then you say, okay, you know, this is too much. Like, why do I need to start transaction so early? I need, I want to optimize to release that connection uh, sooner. Uh, let's. Uh, make the transfer logic block only transactional, right? And then we just do this. We just, in a, your ID, you, do, you say uh, extract method for this uh, block of code, and this is what you get. But wh what's wrong with it? Does anyone know what's wrong with this? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm glad there are people who, uh, who see the problem. Uh, before, the transactional notation was on the public method. Now it's on private and it doesn't apply anymore. And if you don't have tests for every piece of logic where you need to explicitly say this must be transactional, you're gonna hit a big problem here. Right? So you, like if we're talking about money, then you start having inconsistencies. Uh, and it seems initially, oh, why do we do this? Oh, because, because it's, um, it's, it's very easy, it's a declarative way of doing it, right? That's what we kind of generally try, try to do, not to be very empirical, just use declarative ways to do such things. But then there's a more stable solution, right? Is it less declarative? Well, I don't think so. But it always works. There's no magic here at all, right? Just explicitly say, 
I want to call this block of code in transaction. And since Java 8, it's very easy. With lambdas, the code doesn't look uh, ugly anymore, uh, etc. So this, uh, you know, just uh, using quote from Warren Buffett, rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. So in, in finance, it's, it's super important. We sh should never lose money, our money or our customers' money. It's like, it's like the, the most important thing. Especially consider these days, all the money is, in reality, is virtual, right? Uh, it's like it's, it's just numbers in some databases. Uh, regardless on what, what the uh, the financial institution is, like unless you have that in cash, this even that cash is still recorded somewhere. Uh, but this, to solve this problem on the other level as well, uh, if, you know, if we said we need to define our transaction boundaries uh, very clearly and in such a way so it doesn't uh, so it's not uh, fragile. Uh, this something called reconciliation, which is another important process because still there are too many different pro systems involved in processing uh, financial transactions and we end up doing a lot of reconciliations, especially we, when we cross borders, when money goes out of Revolut to uh, other banks and the other way around, there's no transaction there, right? We cannot say, okay, let's do distributed transaction with the, with the other financial institution. So we have another process called reconciliations, which basically is about taking two data sets and making sure they, they agree. And of course, due to this, you know, the story of uh, SQL for us is like very obvious. There's no considerations here for no SQL. If you're processing transactions, no SQL is, is not really something you should consider. Uh, just an uh, example of uh, code that I wanted uh, to show as well. Um, relational databases uh, can do a lot of things that uh, many uh, Java application developers are not aware of, I've, I've noticed. Uh, one of these things is uh, streaming. Uh, on database level, it's a called cursor. In G on GDBC level, it's called scrollable statement which means you don't have to create any complex batch processing if you want to process uh, efficiently uh, a lot of data. You just open scrollable statement behind the scenes. I'm, I'm not showing the, the details of this because it's kind of in our case it's hidden behind the framework. But here in this piece of code, in this line here, final processed uh, standing orders on a specific date, there can be a lot of them and these things, this is not a process that uh, requires uh, you know, immediate processing of the whole uh, population of standing orders created by the users. We need to process them on a specific date, and that's important. We can do it even sequentially if we want it, but generally to process them efficiently, so we don't have, you know, put all of that in memory, uh, you know, or have very complex process uh, bashing that. We just stream it from database and process as we go. And uh, by the way, we uh, use, we rely a lot on uh, a library of, you can call it framework as well, which is called Juke. Uh, if you've never tried it and you do SQL, like I recommend Juke is, is awesome. It's, once you start using Juke, you never have mistakes in your SQL statements. It's uh, probably, uh, like I'm a big fan of, uh, of Juke. Uh, and Lucas Eder, uh, who, who is the uh, creator of it and maintainer. So we, well, what happened here? Which way are we going? Right, and uh, another interesting problem in financial domain is uh, currencies. Uh, it seems to be kind of simple. It's, you have one number to convert to another currency, you just multiply it by rate, and you have a amount in a different currency. The reality is how currency exchange works, there are always two rates, uh, bid and offer, or also called buy and sell. And what, I don't know if any of you still see or use the, you know, the brick and mortar uh, exchange bureaus, maybe at airports, they show you two rates, right, two columns. And in reality, a lot of people 
even people would experience uh, in, in finance and literacy, they sometimes when they start thinking about this, they take a, a pause. Which one do I need to use? Like it, it can, it's, can be tr tricky. Uh, so, uh, but generally people make mistakes all, all the time about this. So we made it, of course, uh, super simple for you. It's just you put a number on one, one side, it multiplied by the rate shown, uh, it will be the, the other number, right? In the, we kind of tried, tried to make it a bit more uh, clear to, to our users and you, know, you don't have to have your own calculations uh, in your head. Uh, for us, uh, finally, in the beginning, again, when we were building this, like, just currency exchange, uh, it's probably just the, the exchange rate class in our code base. It has probably around 300 lines, uh, just, just that class, uh, and the whole area of uh, currency exchange ended up because of kind of in developers in the beginning uh, you know, learning this space, making mistakes in the back end, and in the front end code. So we ended up having uh, probably more than 100 tests just around currency uh, exchange. So uh, just to cover all the possible case, cases, surroundings, etc. Uh, and around currencies as well, another problem that we have in this space is because we kind of, this is another difference between say us and a lot of other fintechs, uh, bank challenges, etc. where we kind of, we try to solve this problem of currency complexity uh, and you know, operating in different markets uh, with different payment channels Currencies, they seem to be like a stable thing. Like, they exist like in total uh, less than 200 currencies in the world. The reality, when we started in 2015, we had few events where currencies were changing. There would be a denomination event when the government decided, you know, this currency, uh, you know, it's too bloated now. You know, we need to uh, issue new currency that will replace it. There will be a period of time there will be transactions coming in in both currencies. Those currencies would get new ISO codes, etc., and you can have to follow this, adapt, so you, this transaction don't come, and you're like, oh, we cannot get exchange rate for this currency because we don't know about it yet, right? Uh, or some corner cases like, uh, have you heard of uh, that that uh, Isle of Man, uh, Josie, uh, Gensry, the Channel Islands? They have their own pound currency. It's Generally, we think it's, it's, it's a British pound, but actually it's, it's a different currency. It's pegged to pounds. It's always one-to-one. -one. It doesn't have its own exchange rate. Uh, because of this, market data providers, Bloomberg, etc., they don't provide rates for those currencies. It's just, they just you tell them, can you give me, like, IMP is uh, Isle of Man pound. Can you give me a rate for it? Tell you, no, I don't know what IMP is. But there is an ISO code for this currency, and transactions can come in this currency. So we end up having a lot of logic kind of this, on these edges, uh, trying to you know, put, adapt all of this to put rules that's saying, okay, these pounds actually are the same as British pound, right? Uh, another thing uh, that we, we made a mistake here, I think it's uh, many uh, startups, they try to you know, go fast and build stuff. We ended up, as I said, it was monolith, and we ended up uh, in the beginning with this... Uh, Spaghetti uh, architecture. Uh, it's called service spaghetti architecture, uh, where uh, you know it, this example here shows that uh, there was a point when I said, you know, I don't want this automatic inj injection. I need to run some something simple. I, I'm gonna just initialize it manually, right? Just explicitly. And I started unrolling, unrolling, unrolling all these dependencies, and I didn't get to the end of it. I, I, it, it didn't work, so because I hit a uh, cyclic dependency, uh, because we, we uh, use Juke, Juke results cyclic dependencies for you. You don't even know; it doesn't tell you that you have some uh, badly designed code. So this kind of thing uh, made made us realize we shouldn't do this anymore. This service spaghetti architecture. Uh, like this is an example how you, you like more explicitly you can get in this situation, right? You have dependence for something, it's injected, but then 
another thing also has dependency on it, and it's like can can get very complicated. You don't even know. So basically, my, my advice to be especially in a new world of microservices, when we say we're gonna build this very focused uh, on some piece of functionality, uh, small applications, services, just injection or injection doesn't give you any benefit really. Like. There's not much bloat that you actually create by doing it manually. So by not doing this, you're making sure that your code is actually simpler and you are able then to, to see when it becomes too complex. So we then switched because of this spaghetti code. Uh, we switched into uh, event-driven monolith phase. Uh, we said, okay, all these services, like to process the transaction, it's not just explicitly moving money from one account to another, it's a lot of other things. Maybe we need to do some checks, you inject one service, we need to do fraud detection, you inject another service, then at the end we want to check, oh, maybe we need to trigger some promotion here, or we need to send a push message. It's a lot of stuff going on when one transaction happens. And kind of this becomes, as on that picture, very, very complicated. So then uh, we resolved it by uh, building own in-house uh, even driven framework. Uh, uh, here's just an, a fragment of, you know, we started defining logic in just smaller pieces. Uh, more, it's it's a CQRS-like framework where there's there are commands and there are repositories to to fetch data. Kind of there's certain separation. And those uh, more compact uh, pieces of logic, uh, commands, we call them actions, uh, they, it, it, the whole framework is built uh, around, again, as I said, DDD uh, concepts. Everything ends up being, uh, every change ends up uh, issuing an event. Uh, and then you can do on top of those events, create things like this. And you know, whatever you want, any side effect you want to do, you don't have to, to inject anything anymore. You just create it. It works independently in a way. And just because of principle that everything issues an event, uh, just not to confuse, it's not uh, CQRS in the sense of uh, the CQRS model where there is event sourcing, where everything starts with an event, and of that we create uh, our read model. We, don't, we didn't do that, this because we didn't have it, first of all, from the very beginning. Um, we, uh, and we didn't want to switch because uh, event sourcing has a lot of own problems with latencies, etc. Uh, there's a lot of complexity. We decided to have dual model in a way, so we consistently always write in even log and at the same time uh, your new state, uh, so which allows us quickly the next decision on the state could be done without calculating it. Uh, and events are used for have to have uh, audit log of everything and to have uh, event driven architecture. So initially, it was, as I said, it's event-driven monolith because all of this was still within that code base, but the code was already segregated into these kind of uh, smaller modules. Uh, which allows us then to move into next phase, uh, which I call event-driven services. Uh, I, don't, I don't like using microservices term because it's kind of, uh, uh, it's the, the name itself is uh, maybe a bit exaggerated because when we say microservices, before we had service-oriented architecture, and those were services. Now we have microservices, which means they're one million times smaller, or in what sense? It's kind of when you, there's this problem because of this, uh, not everyone agrees on what, how big that microservice should be, etc. So if we just uh, say our services should perform, you know, they def they're separated uh, by, um, Domain boundaries uh, and you know they are linked through through events, and so in that previous uh, thing. Uh, oh, by, by the way, on the previous slide was uh, on the front that we used uh, uh, Angular at the time. React was not in fashion yet, and then uh, in 2016 uh, everything was was written into React, uh, uh, which was a good thing. Uh, Angular was first of all it was not uh, done by people specializing in that, it was done by Java developers, it was, it was a nice. So uh, now everything is on React, it's a lot cleaner on the front end as well. So, and the whole thing, this uh, apps, uh, this start being more applications. Uh, in fact, I, I didn't show here the, the whole thing, at that stage already was, uh, in, there was 2016, 
uh, there was a lot more services, but they still was monolithic, uh, like a bit of monolithic uh, code, one, one code base. Uh, and we introduced this event store where we started persisting all these events, and which allowed us not to have this event-driven model just within this monolith application, but start moving these uh, modules into just separate services, separate code base. Uh, because we started sending these events to event store, persisting them there, and stream from there, and then it would allow us to do things like this, uh, which is, I'll, I'll try to explain what was going on here. So, uh, well, one of the problems we have, because we allow you to uh, exchange currency instantly, but reality is uh, we become like a broker for you. Uh, reality is nothing happens instantly in the real world. Like somewhere in the bank there are accounts and then the money should actually move on, on layer below, etc., and layer below. There are settlement processes around this, etc. So what it means when we uh, as, as a user, uh, you have a contract with us, and we tell you we give you the service. We allow you to exchange money quickly and start using it. Uh, we we cannot pull back. It's like okay, we it means we're accumulating risk, risk that we when you say uh, exchange hundred pounds to to euros, we need to get this euros from some. We, we gave it to you now, but we don't have it at that moment, potentially, right? Because uh, it's not like people have all equal amount of pounds and euros that they are constantly exchanging between themselves. It's, it's not balanced in this way, but there is this offsetting effect anyway, uh, which helps. But so we, uh, this kind of event-driven model allowed us to, so initially how we did it, uh, all our risk calculation was happening was just one big query on transactions uh, uh, table on our ledger and it would produce like this, and the numbers, these are our outstanding risks, and our finance department would go and act on it. Initially, it was not big volumes, that's why it was okay, and, but then volume started growing, that calculation, that query started being slower, slower, and hit the point where uh, doing some optimizations on the query level and doing caching, etc. it was all pointless, it was timing out, and we wanted to have instant uh, reaction to this. So even driven allowed us to have this uh, thing, uh, the risk calculation started happening in a separate application, which on every event, every literally transaction, uh, every financial movement, it would update the risk online pretty much. Uh, would be uh, like with uh, delay probably of uh, up to 100 milliseconds. Uh, and that allowed us then to build uh, this whole hedging of, of our risk in an automated manner as well. So, which, uh, you know, our f volumes are a lot bigger and our finance people don't have to go and, and go and trade it on the market that's accumulated risk. Uh, another f big problem in, in finance uh, when you start moving money around, especially with us when we move it around the world uh, and we try to make it as simple as possible, uh, it's uh, f f financial crime, uh, which is one of those things is uh, money laundering. Uh, so f as any financial uh, institution uh, is responsible for t uh, taking care of this problem. And the biggest issue with it is it's not deterministic. It's, uh, f you cannot just say one day we fully solved it. Like we clearly can say this is money laundering this is a uh, genuine transaction. Like, there's no ever 100% guar guarantee on anything. This problem ends up being probabilistic. And this is where uh, a lot of our data scientists, they build um, machine le learning models, uh, constantly adapt them, uh, et cetera, because we kind of have very complex uh, business model, a lot of different users, different currencies, countries, it's, kind of, it's very complex. And uh, guys, uh, did an amazing job there. Uh, uh, our levels, uh, so on this, it's hard to measure, but say on fraud side, which is a similar problem where uh, there are different types of fraud when people uh, fraud to steal uh, people's card details and then try to make transactions on their behalf, etc. So for us to uh, say with introduction of machine learning uh, models for this, 
we decreased uh, this level of fraud uh, from, uh, let me recall, so uh, it went down probably about 40 times, uh, like to the level like we uh, probably about eight times or so below the standard uh, industry uh, standard. Um, so it's, it's quite, quite impressive. I don't know if you, if you use Rulet and you ever had a notification from a system called Shellac. So it's like our in, uh, system uh, based on this uh, ML algorithms that d detects the card, card fraud. Uh, and as I said, it's a very populistic problem and it's a two, two-sided problem. So on one side, we want to catch these bad guys. On the other side, uh, we don't want to affect the Genian users, right? And it's, it's a very hard problem. It's Kind of the teams working on this, they uh, constantly try to optimize to decrease this uh, so-called false positive rate, so that uh, and it's not possible to decrease it to zero, unfortunately. Uh, but in addition to this, there are just more determining process when someone gets into that situation, a gene user gets uh, caught into this trap, we we'll build process how to get them out of it uh, you know, quickly through certain things like you uh, maybe ask or you maybe ask on the app to upload documents proving maybe uh, uh, your transaction, etc. So that it avoids this uh, kind of way you deal with traditional bank. Uh, I happen to be in this situation uh, quite a few times. When you do an international transaction, the just banks just by default blocks it. And you sit in, in ways and then you have to call them and then it takes days, sometimes weeks, weeks to resolve you without kind of you being able to, to do anything and then you just go to the branch. So it's uh, very, very complex, can get very complex. So uh, how we dealt this, with this problems in the beginning with that monolithic uh, architecture, right? There was just within transaction processing, there were all these checks and they were not, uh, they were, because of this they were limited uh, and we couldn't do too much while we process transaction at that point uh, to do much of smart calculations to figure out like, okay, based on the transaction history, do we uh, think this is authorized by you or not? Uh, so this was not obviously scaling uh, and we went into this uh, more machine um, learning based uh, algorithms and that allows us to do something like this, this kind of architecture where uh, our transaction authorization engine, it would ask this, we call it brains. This, uh, most of that stuff is uh, written in Python, because that's what data scientists use. It's uh, the most, uh, uh, yeah, that's the best fit for, for that kind of problem. Uh, gets an answer, but an answer here will be re really prepared already. This fraud detection uh, system, it will already know before that next transaction happens. Um, and in addition, with this new information, we'll be able kind of to, to give an answer very quickly. And then based on that, there will be an event generated based on, you know, it was a successful transaction or was a decline uh, due to uh, suspicion and fraud, would go through our event store, which would stream back into the system. It will update everything, and then this is how it knows then for the next transaction already to give you a quick answer. Uh, because in some uh, cases, it's very critical where uh, on Card transactions, we don't have that much time to do a lot of smart things. Uh, that's why we have, kind of have this model pre-calculating a lot of things, because we would be limited with like uh, 500 milliseconds to do all of it. Uh, we did a lot of other things, so we are slowly getting out of time. Uh, I'm gonna touch quickly uh, on the process itself, on the culture, how, how we do this, right? It's, uh, uh, we known uh, as a company of uh, growing fast, building a lot of features fast, etc. Uh, how, how does it how does it work? How do we do it without um, breaking stuff? So the, the basic principles: people who do this stuff, they they're responsible. There is no pipeline. How would it would be typical in uh, big organizations and in big enterprise? The, there are some business analysts preparing requirements and developers coding that, then there are testers testing it, then there is a release manager, etc. In some organizations, it can be very complex. 
and they may call it agile as well, but uh, plus agile is some, something else, growing like from all, just a few people. Uh, developers become this kind of multi-faceted, all right, you use code just as a tool, your, your programming skills to solve problems. So engineers, because we are on the cloud now as well, dealing with the structures actually is more about coding uh, you, than, you know, actually as in the past dealing with physical hardware, etc. The, all the complexity of the hardware is hidden from you, you just work with these abstract notions, you know, VPC, subnetworks, etc., which are, you know, any, anyone uh, who, who studied computer science should understand at least on the high level. That's why if in, in our case we have specialized DevOps guys who uh, do very specialized projects, and they would do a lot of heavyweight stuff, uh, uh, like maybe doing some uh, working on scalability of this infrastructure, on uh, on uh, scalability of databases, uh, on uh, on network layer, physical connectivity. We have some physical connectivity to to payment networks uh, in, in physical data centers uh, around security, uh, etc. And uh, a huge thing, which, which is like uh, uh, in 2017, when we started growing fast and the team of uh, 10 people quickly turned into uh, a team of 50 uh, developers, uh, people coming from different places, from different understanding of, of HL processes. Uh, it was interesting as well to hear one of the common answers uh, to what it, what it agile is for you? What do you mean by agile process? From engineers to hear, oh, it's Scrum, uh, which is, uh, you know, f we don't see Scrum as agile, kind of, uh, it is because it's kind of rigid process in a way. And from my experience as well, in many organizations in the past, teams struggle to adopt Scrum, which shouldn't be an issue, right? It's, so, whole agile is about people and then processes, right? P process should be helping, not st staying in the way. So we kind of not focused on Scrum, not Scrum, just uh, do things that work. And one thing that definitely works in that phase when we started growing fast uh, in terms of uh, developers, uh, DD was uh, set as like an engineering strategy. Like TDD is for everyone uh, who, who does coding. Uh, is, uh, everyone has to do TDD. Like, not everyone does it on the same level, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, new people as well realize in some organizations, TDD, the understanding of TDD is just having tests, uh, which is surprising to me at the time, but uh, was made it very clear. TDD means you have to test first. If we talk about quality, you have to put quality first, and so you have to write your tests first, and then focus on the problem, describe it, and then you go into implementing it. Like, very, very important concept. Uh, this is why, because of these testers, we didn't have historically testers. We had uh, mobile testers who would, would test UI uh, in the beginning, uh, and that didn't work well, because uh, the ups at the time as well, the rate of bugs was a lot higher uh, because engineers didn't have culture of test for development, uh, all this kind of they offloaded this uh, responsibility for quality to to testers, right? Uh, which was not scaling well, so we decided to change this and uh, testers who like we stopped hiring uh, QA testers completely, and those who who left those few people they focused on creating frameworks. Uh, and uh, infrastructure, so there were what uh, so often is called a software engineering test. Uh, so they would do automation, help developers to focus on solving the, uh, the domain problems, uh, give them tools to write tests uh, uh, efficiently and run them. Uh, and since, since then, uh, so the, the, like, we started tracking the rate of bugs, uh, crashes in the apps in both iOS and Android. It started give motivation to developers actually to protect themselves from these problems uh, because they come back to them at, at the end of the day. Uh, so they started focusing on, on testing a lot and built already frameworks for this. Uh, and as 
kind of mentioned a few times uh, through, through the talk, we, uh, one of the uh, cultural things is we're very problem driven, not solution driven. What it means is solution becomes secondary uh, for us when we, like the, the arguments about to do this way or this way to use this technology or that, when you start uh, putting uh, this around the problem definition, when you define problem well, that everyone who works on it understands it the same way, then this becomes a criteria. Does it something work there or not? And are the differences that are outside of this process kind of become le less important than, and like the, these holy words generally don't, don't happen in the company between engineers. Uh, and uh, of course, another f f very, very important aspect is uh, peer reviews uh, as a way to challenge each other and learn from each other. So it's uh, gen generally it looks like uh, everyone is aware of uh, code review process with pull requests, etc. Uh, we kind of would do this as part of this peer review, but focus again on the problem not on the code. What, what it means is, in this process, engineers are actually they have a slide where we code it as a specification, uh, just again to f focus, to have this focus on DDD, describing first uh, the problem with tests, where uh, it starts from understanding the problem, thinking about it, designing some solution, discussing it with your reviewers, so that by the time you, you prepare some code, a pull request, they already know what it's about, and they spend a lot less time, uh, you know, they ask you a question, they expect to see something in the code by that time, and they focus on this thing if you solve the problem first. Uh, not on, you know, sy syntactical things that are resolved by introducing conventions, and uh, it's like not the, the, the main focus. And... Uh, I'm going to speak because there's not much time. Uh, skip this. And uh, yeah, and the, the obviously, all of those things, they're part of the processes, but without uh, people involved in this, uh, not having drive to create the, the great experience for, for the customers, to be uh, involved and in, uh, you know, understanding the impact uh, engineers create, this, all of that w w wouldn't matter really. So this is probably the, the main thing. Uh, in the whole, uh, yeah, and as a, con as a conclusion, uh, to conclude, so if, if you are problem driven, you learn and apply new learnings fast, you work as a team, you can build anything, not, not just a bank. As, as engineers, as I mentioned, we, we have these benefits of knowing the tools, understanding abstraction, we can apply these skills pretty much to any domain which is, uh, puts us in an awesome position, really, compared to, to some uh, other people. So, but, yeah, don't, don't just try to do all your ideas at once. Just fo be focused. Uh, that's what I will say. Any questions? Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, so how can you actually be able to uh, put the code much into the platform within a second? Because sometimes even the connection takes longer, especially if you're going to connect to China, for example. Mm. So we're talking about, uh, I gave an example of uh, card transaction authorization. What, what it means, uh, the signal, when you uh, say you uh, touch the contactless payment, you touch uh, terminal with the card, from there signal will go through multiple Parties, it will go through some payment gate with acquiring banks. It will go through central network, uh, central service of Mastercard or Visa. Then we'll go to process it to us. And this is what I mean. At that point, when we receive this message, we have these 500 milliseconds to, so to say, okay, this, we can authorize it. Yes. So the entire transaction end to end, yes. It takes longer. The, the whole, for cut transactions, there is a certain limit. Mastercard and Visa, they have uh, some differences depending on the market as well, depending on how all the system is in, in different countries. But uh, as far as I remember, it's uh, f f about five, s five seconds, around five seconds, something like this, so end, end to end. Yeah. Sure. Uh, how do you handle technical debt over time? 
yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question is how we handled uh, technical debt o over time. So technical debt is uh, something we don't define it as a separate thing. Uh, so focus on things like refactoring. And do, since we moved to this architecture of, uh, uh, you know, even an architecture with, with CQRS with small components, this becomes more problem driven. It's like you make uh, the technical debt becomes at certain points is, is just a new requirement. We say, okay, now we reaching certain um, level of customers. We need to think how to scale for the next year. Like, what, can we scale with the current solution? Can we process that many transactions? What do we do? Do we just scale up by giving, you know, uh, more allocating more resources, processing resources, or we actually change something in the code? And we make this decision. We don't look at it as uh, you know, technical debt. Technical debt was at the point when we transitioned to that. It was literally rewriting all the code. And that happened. And uh, we have technical debt uh, probably defined. So, yeah, maybe it's just not to give the absolute answer. Like, there is technical debt in, on mobile apps. So in, uh, on Android app that has been closed, everything was rewritten from Java 6 uh, to uh, Kotlin, uh, which made all Android developers' lives a lot easier. And then on iOS, it's still there's a mix of Objective-C and Swift. So there's a bit of technical debt and uh, a bit of rewriting of uh, in internal uh, frameworks. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.